Good morning, everybody. It is January 27th, 2023. And welcome to Tales from the Heart, a podcast by the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association. And we record our podcast live streaming on Facebook. And I'm just going to do a check here to make sure that we are actually streaming because oddly, Facebook, I keep getting these messages that we're not, but we are. Technology is not always our best friend. And we are streaming, so we are good to go. Today, I am joined by my dear friend of over 25 years, Dr. Harry Lever. Good morning, Harry. Good morning. Nice to have you here again on Tales from the Heart. And our theme for the month of January, as we bring our first month of the year to a close, is kind of setting the plan for your HCM year and what people need to think about as they are evaluating their healthcare plans and health finances and what they need to do to stay healthy and evaluate what they need to do for the year. So I thought we would start our conversation today with what do you as a clinician with 40 years plus experience in HCM, what do you want to see every year in an HCM patient? What tests should they have? How should they be engaging with their healthcare providers? How do we do this? Well, I think that uh, they need to see their uh, HOCOM physician that uh, follows them, and they um, uh, always got to go through a list of uh, symptoms. You know, are you having chest pain, shortness of breath, dizziness? Notice any skipping of your rhythm? You know, go through the usual kind of history, and uh, you know, you you want to be aware if if uh, something has changed. And, uh, um, you know, do you just start have you been feeling some skipping of your rhythm or something like that that hadn't been going on before? And, you know, and I think that one of the things that I always ask people is if they say they're having skipping of the rhythm or some shortness of breath, I ask them about how much alcohol they're drinking, because that's important. You know, you want to make sure that somebody with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy does not drink a lot of alcohol because it can cause. Um, even in people who don't have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you can get, if you're drinking too much, you can uh, get atrial fibrillation. So it's important to know about that. And so we, we ask about that. And then- Let's talk about what tests are needed every year. Yeah, yeah, that's what we're gonna get there. Uh, well, first thing we do, of course, is a routine electrocardiogram. And, um, and then we do an echocardiogram, preferably by the, Hokum physician that you're seeing, so that he he or she has the comparison to to com compare, and also is used to looking at echocardiograms from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients. Because I have found that physicians who don't see many Hokum patients per year, they're really not used to looking at those echocardiograms, and you know they may make some mistakes in the interpretation. So it's important that somebody who's used to looking at these looks at them. Uh, it's also important uh, uh, to, um, you know, if, if there are any symptoms at all, I think it's important that we start, we talk about a stress echocardiogram. Want to see what the exercise tolerance is. What happens to the pressure grading in your heart if you do exercise? And, and particularly if you're getting dizzy, what happens to your blood pressure at peak exercise? Uh, and that's, that can be very important. Uh, uh, the other thing is uh, uh, we want to do a, a monitor and you, we can do the typical mo ultra monitor for two days, but, but now there are newer monitors that we can monitor up 14 days or a month. And maybe if there are any suggestion of any symptoms, I'd go at least 14 days. And, and then you have some idea of what's going on. And, um, um, and I think uh, that, that, that the other thing is, we have found MRI scans very helpful, but the question always comes in: How often should you do it? And I've come to believe now that we should be doing it every three to five years. I have seen some patients. You know, early on we do an MRI, we'd make a diagnosis, we'd see how thick the heart is and how much scar there is. I had a patient not too long ago who I saw at the age of fifteen. He was gene positive completely echo negative. And I had the opportunity 
and I didn't have much, I didn't have a, a lot of opportunities for this to happen, but I had the opportunity to see this patient 10 years later. He was 15 when I first saw him. Now he's 25 and he's having symptoms and you wouldn't believe it. He's got, and he was gene positive, had been echo negative before. Now he's got severe outflow tract obstruction and with Sam and uh, he was getting symptomatic, so much so that he required surgery. So you need, you know, I think that we don't want to wait a long, a long <laughs> time. We don't, can't do them every year. They're expensive, but we want to look to see if there's progression of scar and how fast does that happen? Uh, you know, if you were suddenly to see a lot of scar and, you know, you might want to monitor the rhythm longer to make sure they're not having ventricular tachycardia that they're not even aware of. So I think that three to five years is probably reasonable uh, and to have some idea of what's going on. And to be honest with you, we don't have a lot of data about rate of progression. And it would be neat to try to figure that out over time. Well, know. HCMA or HCMR has been looking at serial MRIs now in the subset of the population. And, um, Hopefully, in a couple more years, we'll get some better understanding of how scar progresses yeah. because of that MR is that's the um, Chris Kramer's MRI study. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Study. Right, right. Yeah. But we have, we don't, haven't had that data available yet to know. Right, right, right. So, but but that that's another thing that you know would be helpful to know. We we definitely need to have more information on what scar means and. It's actually interesting. Uh, this came up at a meeting I was at this week that we look for percentage of scar, but there's really not a standard measurement that is accepted globally as to how scar should be measured because it is an evolving science. And there's a difference between interstitial fibrosis and scar. And when you put the two of them, they're, they're slightly different properties. And if there's a lot of diffuse fibrosis versus specific scar. It looks different on an MRI and how they measure that is different. So we are evolving and learning, right. which speaks right. to why you want to go to a high volume center where they're more experienced in evaluating right. such anatomy. Uh, right. When you mentioned echo before, and I, I sound like a broken record sometimes when I talk about this, but we've, we want to make sure everybody gets their say on the topic. Um, when you go to a community-based cardiologist and you get an echo, they may take 50 pictures of your heart. It might take 15 minutes on the table. When you go to a higher volume program that understands HCM at a deeper level, you may get 200 images of your heart and it could take 45 minutes on the table while you're getting it done because they're more precise and they're going from different angles and they're taking more pictures, which gives us a better understanding of anatomy. Right. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So we know echoes are important. We know MRI is important, event monitoring, stress echo, if necessary. And what is helpful for you as a clinician when a patient comes in for that? I'm here to see you every year or two, doc. How is it most helpful for them to express their symptoms and their frequency of symptoms and their triggers of symptoms? Should they be journaling this and then bringing that to you and having a discussion about maybe figuring out what their triggers are or having that deep conversation. Well, I, guess they could, I guess it doesn't hurt to keep a record of what, you know, uh, some people, uh, some people feel they need to write everything down and other people kind of are living with it and they have a good feeling and they can just tell you, well, you know, I'm just having this, I can't make a flight of stairs like I used to. And it just, it doesn't hurt to write it down. And it, and it also doesn't hurt to, to put down what seems to incite the, the symptoms. And you, you just sort of, you know, you know and that, 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 it doesn't hurt to do that. So I've often recommended to people, if you're having a particularly bad day, think back over the past 48 hours. What did you do? What did you eat? Where did you go? Did you travel? Were you hydrated? Were you dehydrated? Right. You know, did you have a little stomach bug? Did you have, you know, what was going on? Right. And write down as much as you possibly can and see if you can find some commonality as to when you have bad days, because maybe right. you can find your trigger 
And if you alter your behavior, maybe there'll be less bad days. Um, it doesn't always help, but sometimes it does. And it's worth trying if you're frustrated with how you're feeling. Right. Okay. So what else is important to go over with a patient and evaluate annually or biannually, however often you're seeing well, them? I, I think also how... You know, are they having family problems? Are they having, uh, is there a lot of increased stress, something going on, you know? Have they had COVID? You know, that's- and what would that mean to their- Well, I mean, you you would, for, for that, all the more re reason, you'd really be looking at that echocardiogram very carefully to see if there's been any structural change because, you know, COVID can affect the heart. And, and uh, one of the things that we do know um, is that it can affect the coronary arteries and you can get inflammation of the coronary arteries. And so, you know, suddenly if you were to start having chest pain and then you had COVID, that might push you to do a coronary angiogram just to see where you stand. Because you got two, you got, you got about 20% about of people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy anyhow Harry, you're breaking up a little bit on your audio. I'm not, can you hear me? Yeah, your, your audio is breaking up a little bit. Let's just, it's an important point. So I don't think you're, I just think it was a glitch in the internet for a second. So I'm going to go back to that. All right. So, um, so about 20% of people anyhow with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can have coronary artery disease. Uh, if you have underlying coronary artery disease and you were to get COVID and you got some inflammation in your arteries, that could be a serious problem. So if you were ha you know, suddenly getting chest pain after an episode of COVID, that might push to look at those coronary arteries and see what's going on. That, you know, we don't have a lot of data, but that would be something I'd be concerned about. And I think that, uh, uh, so if, but, and again, if there's been a change in your history in terms of forget COVID for a minute, you just have, you have starting to get chest pain. Well, that, that's, that's, and I, I might, if uh, I might start out uh, with, that might push me to do the stress test. But at the same time, uh, the combination of COVID and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients worries me. And we just have to be careful. Well, I will pause on that for just a second. I was in a meeting on Tuesday um, with the National Institute of Health and leadership at NIH, and they gave us some reports on kind of the state of affairs. And there was an interesting um, conversation. This was a, it's more of a casual meeting. It's not a formal thing. There's probably about 60 participants in this NIH um, constituency group, we call it. And we get these updates every year. So they were talking about, you know, a lot of the COVID uh, investigations that they've been doing. <laughs> and what they came up with, um, and it is published, I don't have the publication in front of me right now, that, you know, there was some concern over myocarditis post-vaccination. And they have said the actual myocarditis from active COVID was, I forget the percentage worse. I think it was four times. Don't quote me on that, but I believe that's what they said. It was four times worse with regular old COVID than from the vaccination itself. So yes, there's an inflammatory response to a vaccine. We know that that's right. how this gets into your body and protects you against worse consequences of whatever the disease is, in this case, COVID. But what they came up with was if you are not vaccinated and it hits the heart, it is four times, I believe, more likely to cause myocarditis with serious complications, including heart block as a potential long term. Right. So um, I just want people to remember to get their COVID vaccines. They're still important. Um, and if you if you think you're safer to not get it, having COVID without the vaccine on board is actually harder on your heart. And we've proven that now with multiple studies and please be smart. Um, we don't know what the future will hold in terms of recommendations for vaccination, um, but please stay in touch with it. And it's just like the flu vaccine. I suspect this is how we're gonna be looking at it going forward. 
we'll deal with that later um, when we know more. We don't know a lot yet. And I think that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients particularly should be wearing their masks. Well, I, I, I just came back from traveling. I was on a train. I have a little cold, as you can all hear, but I had the cold before I was on the train. And it was, uh, there's about 25% of the people on the train wearing masks at this point. Um, I told a funny story. Uh, okay, so we're going to go into story mode here for a minute, Harry. We didn't talk about this in advance. So I get on the train and I have my mask on because I've been traveling with a mask before COVID because I'm a transplant patient and you don't know who has a cold next to you or whatever else they have. So I have my mask on and I made a phone call and the woman sitting next to me did not have a mask on when I got on the train. And I called a friend who happens to have COVID right now. And I, he said, how are you doing? And I said, I'm just a little stuffy. You have COVID. I'm fine. How are you? And he told me he was, you know, not feeling very well, et cetera. This woman starts freaking out at me. She's like, why didn't you tell me you had COVID and you got on a train? My mother's 101 years old. I'm like, I don't have COVID. The person on the phone has COVID and you can't catch it from the phone. And then she got mad and she walked away and she came back a little while later with her mask on. And the, the madness kind of hit me that, wait a minute, you have a 101 year old mother that you're traveling to see on a train with a bunch of strangers and you don't know whether or not they have colds, COVID, flu, whatever, and you're unmasked and I'm wearing a mask and you get mad at me. Like I, I didn't understand the logic on that one. So if you're traveling, there's a lot of bugs out there. You don't want to get any of it. Well, the, the other interesting thing is I got to tell you, my wife and I have noticed that in long before COVID, it was not uncommon. If we had flown, we come back with a quote of cold. Yep. And, and I think that we've decided forget COVID for other reasons. We're just going to wear a mask when we fly because we don't want to get sick with anything. So I travel a lot and pre-transplant, I would always come back from AHA or ACC. I was always sick the next week, just always. Right. And once I transplanted and I'm like getting back on a plane, I put my mask on and I haven't gotten sick while traveling until this fall when I went overseas and in Sweden, like nobody was wearing masks anywhere. And there was just a lot of stuff going on. And I've never been to Scandinavia. So I'm sure there was like some Scandinavian cold that saw me coming and wanted to attach to me. So I came back with a cold from Scandinavia. But otherwise, that was the only time that I've gotten sick while traveling since my transplant. Not bad. Not bad at all. Um, okay, we have some questions popping in here. Um, so Jamie says that she loves Dr. Lever. He was so good to me at the Cleveland Clinic. So say hi to Jamie. Hi. Um, and Nas, um, Nas, you have, um, you're asking some technical questions here. We don't do consult by podcast. Um, I'm not sure what country you're coming to us from. You're stating that you have a septum that's 43 millimeters and not obstructed. Do I have to undergo myectomy? We only do myectomy for those with um, obstruction. But if you have a 43 millimeter septum, I'm hoping that you're being evaluated by a center of excellence and they've reviewed your risk factors for sudden cardiac arrest. And um, they've given you some guidance on an implantable defibrillator. And um, I would encourage you to contact the office and we can align you with care uh, models that might be available wherever you're at. Um, so Harry, what would concern you over, uh, somebody with a 40, septum over four? Uh, I, I'd be very concerned about that. And you would want to know if there's scar and they should absolutely have an MRI. Okay. If they haven't had one very recently, but that that's very, very thick. And it, it also, uh, needs the echo needs to be carefully looked at and you need even, even if um, that, that's a 43, 43 millimeter septum, it is possible that you can have outflow tract obstruction just from the walls down in the mid portion of the ventricle hitting. And we've had not many, but a few patients who became symptomatic enough that we realized that we could open up the ventricle further down, not because they had SAM, but because they were occluding the cavity totally. And sometimes just doing a 
doing a, a myectomy farther down can make them feel better. But that again, doesn't happen that often, but it can happen in a few patients where there is a form of mid cavitary ob obstruction. <clears throat> okay. So it needs to be very carefully looked at. Something that thick, you gotta really look very carefully. So rounding up the questions for what should people do for the year, we know the testing is important. We want to check the anatomy of the heart. We want to check the rhythm of the heart. We want to check to see if there's additional obstruction or any at all. We also want to check the ejection fraction to see if it has dropped or blunted because this could be another indication of additional heart failure potential. Um, what else are we looking for? Atrial arrhythmias, ventricular yeah, arrhythmias. Yeah, I mean, that that we'd be looking at with uh, with uh, the, the Holter monitor or, uh, you know, longer term monitor looking for AF. Yeah, I mean, you'd really want to know about that. And, and, you know, I've come to believe that if we have patients with outflow tract obstruction and they go into atrial fibrillation, that's that would be an indication for me to have them have surgery to relieve the obstruction and maybe do something to the left atrium to, re, re, you know, the, to make sure that the, we don't let the cavity get too large. We because atrial fibrillation can really cause the atrium to enlarge, and if you know it, your atrial fibrillation becomes more difficult. The larger the left atrium, the harder it is to treat it. And we like to. I think now we need to intercede earlier when we have uh, atrial fibrillation. How important is knowing and tracking your left atrial dimension? How big your left atria well, is? Well, I think it. I think if 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 you see that the left atrium is getting larger, and you have outflow tract obstruction, I think that's another that would push me to think about doing surgery sooner than later. Because once that cavity enlarges, it's going to be harder, even with surgery. Once it, I mean, once it gets enlarged and you get some scar tissue in there, it gets harder for it to shrink after the surgery. So we don't want it to get too enlarged. And if, it, if we start seeing some increase in size, we want to take a real careful look for atrial for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and you know that kind of stuff too. So we try to prevent that from getting there. Absolutely. Okay. So we want to evaluate the structure the rhythm, the lifestyle, and the mental health of the patient. There's a lot going on in these families. There's screening of your children and your siblings and your parents. And there's a lot of emotional burden that goes along with the diagnosis of HCM. So we want to make sure that you're physically taking care of yourself and that you're mentally taking care of yourself because your mental health specifically drives your physical health. And we need to make sure that we have um, opportunities for you to talk about that. Um, I'm actually in some talks right now with a couple of the online teletherapy companies to look for ways that we can help patients identify mental health professionals, maybe from the comfort of their own phone. And um, I'm looking at some ideas to provide training to the therapists on what HCM is and the, and the burden of disease and some of the chronic issues that happen in an HCM family. So we're working on some programs there. Cross your fingers that I'm able to figure out a way to make all that happen um, because I think it would be really helpful to the cardiologist treating HCM patients to have a resource to refer them to and to have patients have an opportunity to speak to a mental health professional in the comfort of their own home um, when they need to. So um, it, it uh, we're, we're working on some new projects. Um, I, I'm going to pivot the conversation um, to a topic that is important, uh, and Harry has spent quite a long time trying to raise awareness around, and he and I have worked on a number of projects together, uh, and hopefully we'll do some more in the future on drug quality. So there's new drugs hitting market. We don't worry so much about the quality of new drugs that are labeled drugs. They're, they're the person who invented it, the manufacturer is still manufacturing it. And you know that it's got a certain potency and consistency. The problem is generics. They're inexpensive, but the quality due to something called the Generic Drug Act 
is not guaranteed to be 100% of the name brand. It's between 80 and 120% or thereabouts of the name brand. So you could get a higher dose, you could get a lower dose, and there could be problems with the dissolution rate, how fast it absorbs into your body, especially with um, extended release formulations. Um, because those extended release formulations came into effect after the Generic Drug Act was a thing in the early 80s. So Harry, what's happening today, like literally today, related to the generic drug quality issue and the um, pipeline of availability of drugs? Well, it's becoming worse because all people seem to worry about now is money and they're not concerned about quality. The fact of the matter is, uh, to get a quality drug, it may not cost that cost that much more money, but people are just pinching pennies. And the first thing that I would tell you is, if you've been on a medicine that you have been stable, your blood pressure is, suppose you've got high blood pressure, blood pressure has been stable, or you've been on something for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and everything was going along all right, and you suddenly see a change you got to see if the pharmacy has changed the medication that you're taking. Now, what I, what I mean by that is you don't want to walk out of that pharmacy with a different pill than you did before. You want the same. You don't, they'll, try to, they'll try to tell you that, oh, all, all medicines are the uh, different brands. It doesn't matter. That's not true. And what you've got to do is you've got to look at the tablet, look at the color. They, there's, a, there's frequently a, um, um, a, something, an impression put on, like a number or something put on the tablet. You want to make sure that nothing has changed, the color, the shape. The, and there is a, uh, um, there is, um, a uh, program on the computer called drugs.com. It has a pill identifier. You take the tablet, you take the number off that tablet. You can put down shape, color, and the number, and you can identify who the manufacturer is. But it's important. The most important thing is when you look at those tablets, do not walk, do not leave the pharmacy till you make sure that they haven't changed it. Once you leave, they won't take it back. So you want to know in the pharmacy... (laughs) And then you want to tell them, I don't want something different. Now, they're going to give you an argument. But you, well, we can't get anything else. And I've had so many cases of people that we've, we've done this and they went back to feeling better just changing the manufacturer. So it's very, very important that it stay the same. I have no money in any of these drug companies. I, I, I you know, I'm nothing. I'm just telling you what I've seen in terms of quality and you, you don't let the pharmacy change it for you. Now so it's I have, to- I have here a bottle of pills and this is my amoxicillin because I pre-medicate before dental work and I'm in the middle of doing some major dental work. And if you want to know who your manufacturer is, it's always on the label. Um, they were kind enough to put this in about three point font for me, but, um, I will hold this up to the camera and my nail is underneath the name. If you can see it, I don't know if it's gonna, you can see that tiny, tiny print there under amoxicillin, wait, where are we going? That tiny, tiny print right by my nail. That's where the manufacturer is written. And I'm not kidding you. I think it's like a three or four point font. Um, I actually cannot read it without my glasses. Um, But you do, that's where you can check your manufacturer. It's either under the name, or it's on the bottom. There's down also the lid. something called an NDC number, and yep. there is a program called Daily Meds, and you can uh, you can uh, uh, look up the NDC number, and it'll tell you also who the manufacturer is. And there's something there's something that I've learned. They're called repackagers. A repackager is not a manufacturer. They just package the so. You don't want to know who the packager is. You want to know who the manufacturer is. So there's a couple of new companies now, and some states have made it a little easy to do this. New Jersey happens to be one of them. So they have an office in New Jersey, and you think that they're being manufactured in New Jersey. 
and they're not, they're manufactured overseas, but they have a New Jersey address. So heads up to anybody who thinks their drugs are being manufactured in New Jersey. There are no major drug manufacturing plants in New Jersey that I'm aware of that are doing major generic drug manufacturing, but there's a lot of companies who use New Jersey addresses for people to think that they are US based. So know where your drugs are being made and the quality of those drugs. Reminder, the FDA is currently inspecting sites outside of the United States via Zoom. So your drug manufacturing plant doesn't have a human walking around and checking to see if everything's okay. And they're doing it via Zoom. So who's showing them what on a camera? All due respect to the FDA, they, they don't have the funding to go out and do these inspections. And if you're going into another country, the FDA only has limited authority to just show up. They tend to be planned in advance if they're going to be in person. But since COVID, I'm not sure that they've gone back to any in-person inspections. My understanding is they're pretty much being done via Zoom right now. So if you don't have somebody inspecting your facility, this is a problem. There is an organization, uh, it is a bipartisan organization seeking to bring drug manufacturing back to the United States. And I think this is a very important topic. And I think we need to know that we can go and inspect a drug facility and make sure that the quality of drug that we're getting is appropriate and that the supply chain of the root chemicals that are making these drugs are clear and understood and that we have pathways that are agnostic. Like what if we can't get things out of another country because there's another pandemic? We don't have drugs. And we're seeing <laughs> we're seeing shortages all over the place in drugs now. Right. Um, a neighbor was posting, okay, ADHD moms and dads, where are you getting your drugs for your kids? Because they're out at this pharmacy and they're out at that pharmacy. So there's drug shortages all over the place right now. We need to bring manufacturing back to the states where we can control it a little bit better and to ensure the quality of those drugs that are being put into so many people, so many people. So, okay. Um, so Nas, who has that 43 millimeter septum is writing from Germany. Um, so Nas, I'm going to ask you to call the office and set up an appointment because you're asking very specific questions that are country specific that we're going to have to take a little bit deeper dive into. So please do contact us. You can email us at support at 4hcm.org and we'll be more than happy to assist you. Um, so let's see. Somebody else asked about genetic testing. We didn't talk about genetic testing on the annual stuff. I got to go back to that for just a moment. Um, so how often should people revisit the concept of genetic testing? Well, I think um, if, if you, you're, you've been tested and you're uh, gene uh, positive, well, then you're positive, and that's what it is. Uh, there are some genes that become more over time. They continue to be looked at, and they become significant. It's not that the gene changed. It's what has been studied, and you see that they're They've become, based on looking at more people, that they may become significant. So if once, once the family is, for the most part, once the family is looked at, uh, if you're gene positive, if you're gene positive. But again, you got to be a little careful if, if now some of them have become significant. So it's, it's worth going back and looking at what, what your gene test was called and see if there's been any change in what laboratories are saying about them. So I'm gonna to add to that and ask you for your input here. So somebody's posting that they have HCM and they don't have children, so they didn't bother doing genetic testing. Okay, that sounds logical, except for the fact that not all HCM is what we think it is. And there are mimickers or phenocopies, other disease pathways right. that actually have their own treatment pathways now. Fabry's disease, amyloidosis, uh, Dannon's HCM. So there are other reasons the heart gets thick than sarcomeric HCM or no mutation identified. So I would argue that in today's world with targeted therapies for some of these diseases today and others coming down the line, that there is value to genetic testing that we 
maybe didn't see a few years ago. It was, do you have it in the family? Can we trace the gene through the family? And that was the value. But today we have the opportunity to see things a little bit differently. We have genetic therapies coming for myosin binding protein C. And if you are a myosin binding protein C patient, but you haven't been genetically tested, then you won't have that opportunity for potentially a genetic therapy. So I think getting the test done, it's typically paid for by insurance. It's not very expensive anymore. I would encourage everybody with HCM diagnosis to get genetically tested. And if you're a gene negative or no identified mutation found, there are going to be studies coming up that you're going to be able to participate in to help us discover those new markers, those new genes, or those multiple genes that might be playing together that create the HCM phenomena. So um, I'm like, I'm all in on genetic testing. <laughs> I think we should all at least get some data on that. Not sure how much of it's going to be actionable today versus tomorrow versus ever. But if you don't know, then you don't know. So I think it, it's got a lot of value there. Um, and I think you have to go broad and not targeted. When we started doing genetic testing, I remember Quest Diagnostics called me to, to pick my brain for a little bit on what I thought about genetic testing. And this is probably 12, 13 years ago. And they said, um, well, why don't we just do myosin binding C, protein C and myosin heavy chain? And we'll just test for those two because those are the heavy hitters. I'm like, but you're going to give people half information. Why would, you, why would you do that? So you have to go broad, but understand that we don't know a lot about some of the more rare diseases and the more rare mutations yet. But if we learn that they're there, we can start to evaluate those families more closely and we can look for other patterns. So um, I would encourage everybody to get tested. It, it, there's no downstream negative consequence. You've been diagnosed with HCM. So people are like, well, can somebody use that genetic information against me? You already have a clinical disease. There's nothing in the pathway that's going to change insurance access, life insurance access, anything like that. Your disease is your disease. Knowing the genetic marker just adds to our understanding and yours of what your options might be. If you're looking at testing your kids, well, that's a whole other question. And you need to talk to a genetic counselor about the ups and downs of doing that. But for those of you who are diagnosed, go get tested. Like point blank, go get tested. You don't know what therapies are being evaluated right now. And you might have a pathway to a better treatment based on your genes. So. Leslie, I'm glad you think so. Leslie thinks we have some great information today. So um, thanks for sharing that. And if there's any other questions, now would be a great time to post them because I'm sure Dr. Lever would love to answer your questions. So Harry, what are you doing this year? Let's just talk. What's going on? Any trips planned? Any? No, we're actually going to start traveling. And we're, uh, we just, we actually, we're probably going to go to Delaware for a week. Nice. Very yeah. good to hear that. Yeah, and and, and you have your your blow up mattress there because your right. granddaughter's been visiting. Right, right. right. So uh, how's the grandpa business going these days? Okay, I'm doing all right. That's great. No, and actually, they li they live in Cleveland, so we're lucky. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. And and how many grandkids do you have now? Just two. Just two. Just Is two. that a hint to your kids? Well, we uh, right now it's just two. Two two is a good number. I have. We have our second one coming very, very soon in our family. Well, great nephew for me um, is coming. So Xander's getting a little brother any day now. Xander was born while we were podcasting one day back in June of uh, 21. And his little brother's due any day now. So um, I don't know what his name's going to be. They're keeping that a secret. Um, so I will be shouting it far and wide once we figure out who he is. So we've got a big year coming up and I do have some announcements while we wait for anybody to post any questions. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to hold something up to the screen. So if you're listening to the podcast, you cannot see this amazing new gray t-shirt that says not all of those with HCM are grumpy like Otto with our double hearts and our HCM awareness on the back. Um, but you can see them at 4hcm.org and you can order your t-shirts now. If you are in the New York, New Jersey area, we're going to do something really fun next week. I have rented a movie theater. I never thought I would say I've rented a movie theater for a night, but I've done that. 
And we are going to have a viewing, a group viewing of a man called Otto featuring Tom Hanks as Otto Anderson, a grouchy guy with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. There are some scenes in the movie that are so, they're a little triggering. I warn those who have HCM, there are some triggering scenes that will bring you to very emotional memories, your diagnosis, your disclosure of your diagnosis to a significant other, having symptoms in front of people and how you deal with it, medical intervention, syncope. But the way Tom Hanks plays Otto, it's HCM is kind of the back of the movie. It's, it's to me, it's every scene. I see the HCM families that I work with every day in these scenes. Um, but it's not, the whole movie isn't about HCM. Otto has a lot of other stuff that happens in his life and it's kind of tough. But that to me is the beauty because while we're trying to live our lives, go to work, have family, have friends, have neighbors and be whole people. HCM is right here all the time. And you never know when it's going to do something quirky, like make you pass out in the street. Um, so Otto tells a, a beautiful story about life with HCM. And I don't think Tom Hanks planned on me like becoming his number one fan now because of the way he played the HCM scene. Um, but I encourage everybody to watch it. And there is a particular scene. You'll know it's coming up when the sound goes a little wonky. And it is the closest thing I've ever seen in cinema to what I've felt having active symptoms of near syncope and heart racing and th the sound alteration, the angle of the film and how he just like shuts down and like doesn't want to talk to anybody else, just wants to be by himself to deal and get through this moment. Um, it was very triggering emotionally, but it was very cathartic to see. Yes, I cried. I cried a lot at the end of the movie. It's not all medically accurate. We don't get into, did he have obstruction? Didn't he have obstruction? What drug was he on? What therapy did he have? We're not going there. It's dramatic, um, but it's beautiful. So if you are in the area of Northern New Jersey and you would like to come to Morristown and watch a film with us, go right online. Tickets are on us. I'm even buying the popcorn and the soda. You can have water if you want, um, but come on out, join us. And at the end of the movie, we're going to have a conversation. And we're going to talk about the movie and we're going to kind of debrief it together. I'll be bringing tissues because there will be tears and there will be triggering moments. I will tell you that there are some other triggers in this movie. Um, believe it or not, it's considered a comedy, um, but there are three attempted suicide scenes and they are intense. It has nothing to do with his HCM. There's other stuff going on in his life. And he doesn't commit suicide. And every time he tries, he is saved by somebody who needed him and he has value and he made a big difference in these lives. And the story is beautiful. It's an absolutely beautiful story. It's dark. It's funny. It's quirky. Um, but the HCM scenes, spot on. So come out and join us. We're not all grumpy like Otto, but we might understand why Otto is a little grumpy. He's got a lot to deal with and the rest of the world doesn't understand him. So obviously Otto never called the HCMA. We would have helped him out, but that's. Have you called Tom Hanks? Um, unfortunately, I don't have his phone number available to me, but I do have roads into him. I have been in conversation with Sony Pictures and we're trying to get them to add a tagline when it streams on Netflix for information on HCM to come visit us. Um, and we have our media team working with them. So Tom, if you're listening, mm -hmm. I know the people who did the fact finding for your book, for your movie and your plot part. We're definitely on the HCMA's message board. There are things that were done that definitely, you looked at the old message board. I think you might've snuck into the Facebook community potentially because damn, you were good. And they had real good data. Mm -hmm. and. Oddly, a friend of a friend's son was on the writing team and we're connected on Facebook. So I, I don't know. I think we might've had something to do with the fact finding there, but 
nothing official as of yet. Um, so that's all great. So if you're in the area on the 2nd, there's two things happening on the 2nd. February 2nd will be my sixth transplant anniversary. Mm. So what better day to start Heart Month than coming together, watching A Man Called Otto together with media, medical professionals, patients, and lawmakers, and have a discussion about HCM. We will also be talking about our new program called, well, it's an old program that we're repackaging. It's called Drill Dr. Heart, and it is a cardiac arrest drill for houses of worship, teams, schools, and workplaces, and other areas where people congregate at a regular interval. So knowing CPR, fantastic. Having an AED, fantastic. Knowing how to use CPR and an AED together, awesome. But when you're in a moment where things get real and you have to actually do it, do you know what to do? Do you know in your house of worship, are people CPR trained? Is there an AED in the building? If there's not an AED in the building, are you relying upon EMS to bring it? What is the closest door to the room that you're in most frequently? And how is it opened? Is it locked? Do you have to send somebody? There's this pre-planning that you need to do and have a discussion as a group. And then you need to drill it. And here comes the fun part. We're going to do a challenge. You're going to drill it. You're going to practice it. You're going to film it. And you're going to post it to social media. And you're going to join a competition. And that competition could win your organization a free AED. This is a program that we originally put together in 2010, and we've updated it to 2023 and social media. It will be launched shortly, so stay tuned for that. And you can take your community organization, film it, post it, and if you get the most engagements in your category, you can win an AED for that community organization. All the details will be on the website soon. Harry, what do you think about that plan? That's a good idea. I think so. And my nephew helped me create it in 2010. And what's really cool about that is at 13 years old, he was witness to his mother's cardiac arrest. And then he became a teacher and a coach. And he did some work. He still does some work with USA Volleyball. And he said, well, we're not really ready for a cardiac emergency. And then I did something as everything happened this past month. I went back and I revisited this program that he and I put together in 2010. And I went back and I viewed a videotape from March 4th, 1990. Do you remember what that day is? Hank Gathers had a cardiac arrest on a basketball court. Mm. And it is filmed. And I have it and I'm not putting it out because it's horrible to watch. Um, but Hank Gathers made a shot, ran mid court, kind of stopped for a second, put his hands on his knees, had this look on his face. He had a known diagnosis of HCM yeah. <clears throat> and then he pivoted and then he crumbled to the ground. His coach came running out to him, kind of crawled into his co coach's lap and went down again. And the response in 1990, there weren't AEDs out in the public yet, but there was CPR, but nobody started it. Mm. He held his hand as he died in front of them and it's all on film. And you watch him take his last breath. But if you take that film and how heartbreaking it is and what the Gathers family has endured, and then you look at the events of Monday Night Football and Damar, that young man had hands on him in 10 seconds. I'm not quite sure the time to first defibrillation could have been a little extended, but there was great CPR done right away. And they were on him and they had a plan and it worked. If you go down and have a cardiac arrest, you're probably not going to have a medic watching you and have hands on you in 10 seconds. But it would be really nice if your coworkers, your teammates, your fellow parishioners, your community members knew what the hell to do to save you. And that's why we want you to practice drill Dr. Hart so you can be more like DeMar's outcome and, and not like Hank's. So 
come join us in the challenge. It'll be launched very soon. And I encourage every one of you to join us on HCM Awareness Day, which is coming up on February 22nd. We will be holding two sessions that day, live sessions. The morning session will be a legislative briefing on the Healthy Cardiac Monitoring Act. Everybody is welcome to join. And in that briefing, we're going to talk about why we need to do better work in evaluating our children's cardiac health and getting people pipelined into cardiac care faster. And then we'll be hearing from all of our HCM centers through videos and real live comments and engagement and our industry partners on what we want to, people to know about HCM, what trials are coming, what we're going to need the community to engage in, and why we are such an amazing community that requires attention. And then at the night session, we're going to teach you about some new programs that we have here at the HCMA, like our NEST program. You'll learn more about that soon, as well as hearing some amazing inspirational stories and a whole bunch of other content. So stay tuned for that, um, that registration coming to you in the next couple of days so you can join us for one or both of the sessions. So um, Kristen says, hi, Dr. Lever. Leslie says, hi, Dr. Lever. My husband and daughters were your patients and they miss you. Um, and Diana saying hi from Spain. So that wraps up our hour of Tales from the Heart and some announcements there. Any parting thoughts, Harry? No, I don't think so. Go to the movies, go see yeah. Otto. Right. Go in the middle of the day. There's not a lot of people there. And it will be streaming by the end of the month, I believe, on Netflix. So stay tuned for more. Harry, thanks for joining us today. And thank you all for participating in Tales from the Heart. Um, Brett, uh, thanks for the comments. And Brett says hello. All right, guys, we're signing off. And I just want to give a last shout out to our sponsors. And uh, we have some additional sponsors this year for Tales from the Heart. We have Imbria Pharmaceuticals. Tanaya Therapeutics, Cytokinetics, and Bristol Myers Squibb. Thank you so much for your support of Tales from the Heart. It's because of your support that we can provide great programming like this and keep our HCM community nice and tight. Thank you all and have a great day.